we've been talking about a one-shot prisoner's dilemma in which each person, each player here had an incentive to defect, to cheat on that collusion agreement in this case. Um, we end up in that Nash equilibrium, which was worse than that cooperative outcome. Um, so one-shot game, we predict as long as rational players play the dominant strategy, which seems a reasonable assumption, then we're probably going to get to that Nash equilibrium. Um, things get more interesting if we play a repeated game. Um, so suppose just for the example we're going to play this game every year between these two firms might be more often less often but let's just say once a year we're going to end up we're going to make a production decision and um, but we know we're going to repeat this game um, then our payoffs change so let's see what happens here now I, I decided on two different possible strategies obviously these would not really be the only two options but uh, just for the sake of this example so there's a strategy called tit for tat um, and what that means is that you start out cooperating in the first round or the first year in this case and then after that you're gonna do whatever the other player did in the previous round so if, if the other player also cooperated then you'll continue to cooperate um, but if the other player defected, and so remember if, you know, in one round, if the other player defects, they get that best payoff, you get the worst payoff, that's the sucker payoff, um, if you're cooperating while the other person defects. Um, so in tit for tat, if the other player defected on you in the last round, you will defect in this round. Um, and then you, in this case, you're gonna get stuck in that defection outcome um, because then the other players, if all the other players also playing tit for tat, then um, you'll keep defecting. But uh, so we now, so we now have four possibilities in the, in this game. So let's just go through what would obviously. So the other strategy here is to always defect, just to just to always choose that cheating outcome, um, cheating strategy. So let's just go through this game. So if um, for firm one, two possibilities. Um, Firm two plays tit for tat, which means I can cooperate in the first round. Um, so either I could also cooperate and get a hundred dollars, and then uh, every every. So, so we're talking about um, picking a strategy and kind of sticking with that strategy, right? So every year, we're just going to be cooperating with each other. We're just going to keep playing tit for tat, which means once we start cooperating, we're just going to keep cooperating. Um, so we get that hundred dollar payoff every year. Um, or I could just defect, and again, I'm choosing the strategy of always defect, so the other guy's playing to protect, which means the first round, I get the good payoff, right? Because they're cooperating, I'm going to defect, I get the 115, but then we get stuck in that defection outcome. So, because next round, if they're playing tip for tat, they're going to defect, I'm still defecting, we're just each going to get 75. So I get that better payoff in the first year, but every year thereafter, again, if, if these are my strategies, I'm going to get 75. Right, so as long as I don't discount the future too much, right now I'm comparing these two outcomes, um, these two payoffs, then this starts to look better. Right, so even, even though this is lower in the first year, but if every year after that I get 100 rather than 75 every year, then as long as we play long enough and as long as I don't discount the future too much, this is actually going to be a better payoff. Right, so now assuming that that's true, then this is now a better payoff, so I do have the incentive to play tip for tat, right? And the other guys, it's symmetrical. It's going to be the same exact thing for the other player. So again, as long as we play enough rounds, and it could be that we don't know how long we're going to play this game, um, and as long as I don't discount the future too much, so so I have some degree of patience, then um, this looks better for both of us, and this is where we can get collusion to work. Um, so again, in this case. We have firms colluding, obviously, from society's point of view or consumer's point of view, that's not a good outcome, but there could be other types of games where it's a good thing that we can reach that cooperative outcome um, and, uh, and get to this outcome rather than getting stuck in that defection outcome or, or one of these other ones. So once we repeat the game, really lots of different things can happen in this, you know, just have one particular example of what might be a repeated game, but lots of things can happen in repeated games. But just to give you an idea of, of, um, of what could happen once we move away from that one-shot game. Um, so we get what's sometimes called tacit collusion. If we don't, it may, it may be illegal for us to actually 
have an agreement to collude, but if we understand that this is the game that we're playing with each other without actually having a, any kind of formal agreement, we can get what's called tacit collusion, you know, I know that if I defect on you, we're going to get into this price war and it's going to be bad for both of us, so let's just cooperate without ever having to say that we're cooperating. So we can get collusion that way and, it, and essentially we're making the game into something like this. Um, so we're not going to get too much into this. There's a lot more interesting things on game theory we can go into. Um, it's a little book recommendation. So this kind of goes into these game theory tournaments that were done and where they um, found out that this, t this simple tit-for-tat strategy was a, was a very successful strategy empirically versus all sorts of other strategies of, that you might um, try to come up with for how you're going to play a repeated game. So, um, you know, go read that. Let me just uh, look at just a couple other games just to see what other games might look like. Um, so here we have, um, it's kind of like picking what side of the road to drive on. So you could either choose the right side or the left side of the street um, to drive on, and let's just run through our payoffs. Um, so for the first player, I'm going to look at the, the two options of what the other player might do. So if he goes right, I want to go right and be on the same side of the, of the road. Um, and if I were to go to the other side, you know, do the opposite, whatever he's doing, you know, that's I just arbitrary payoffs. So obviously it's a very bad payoff. Um, if we choose opposite sides. So in this case, unlike the prisoner's dilemma, there are there isn't a dominant strategy here, right? So player one doesn't have one strategy that's best regardless of what the other player is doing, which is what we had in the prisoner's dilemma, but his best strategy depends on what the other guy's doing, so it's not a dominant strategy. Um, and it's going to be the same thing for the other guy, um, and we end up with this. So in this case, we have two Nash equilibria, both cases in, in which we're just going and you know driving on the same side of the street. So, so from this particular game, it doesn't matter which one we chose, um, but we want to pick one of those two outcomes, and we get to those better outcomes as opposed to any kind of mix and match here are the bad outcomes. So this is what's sometimes called a pure coordination game, because unlike Prisoner's Dilemma, there's no conflict of interest between the two players here. We just want to get to one of these two cooperative outcomes. Um, and so we just have to coordinate on which outcome we're going to choose. Um, here's another game. This is uh, Splitter Steel. So you can look up the game show on this. Um, so we, we, we are deciding whether we have this pot of money or we're going to decide whether to split it or whether one person is just going to steal the pot. And so the way the payoffs are set up here is uh, let's just run through the game. So player one, you know, is looking, what happens if player two splits? Well, if I split, I get 50, but if I steal, I get the whole pot, I get that 100, so that's that's better for me. Um, if uh, player two steals and I split, I get nothing, right? They're gonna steal the pot. Um, and if we both steal, we both get nothing, right? So if that's the way the payoffs are set up, which, you know, you might argue that I wanna uh, make these payoffs different, but if they are both zeros, then we're going to say, you know, I'm indifferent between these two, and so I'll just, I could pick either one, um, and so that's how I'm going to fill out this game. Um, we would call that a weakly dominant strategy um, of steal, because either I do better or I do just as well by stealing, right? So I, I, do, I can do no worse um, by picking steal in either of these possibilities, so steal is what we call a weakly dominant strategy. And the other player is going to have the same strategy, um, weakly dominant strategy of steel. So either I'll, they'll do better or just as well by playing steel. So each player has that weakly dominant strategy, but in this case we get three Nash equilibrium. Um, so again, in any of these outcomes, you are playing your best strategy, or, or at least no worse of a strategy, um, given what the other player is doing. So that makes it a Nash equilibrium. So we actually have three of them in this game. So just to give you, and there's other kind of games we can do. Um, I'll do more of them in class um, for my students, but, uh, but just to give you an idea of what other kinds of games might look like.